I'm Louis Perrochon. Thanks for coming um, to this Tech Talk. I, I, I went to Australia over Christmas and I met Stephen Prower, who works on the Bionic Eye, and, I, and it turned out he's coming to San Francisco for a conference, and I said, why don't you come to Google? Because this is really the most amazing thing, I think, that's happening like in, in medicine these days. And so he agreed to come, and so I'll leave it up. I'll leave the floor to you. Louis, thanks very much, and uh, thank you all for coming, those who are here in person and those who are here uh, by the miracle of uh, teleconferencing. Um, I love being interrupted, so please feel free to ask questions as we, as we proceed. Now, I imagine that everyone in the room recognises uh, this person um, from Star Trek, Geordie, who is blind, and you'll recognise his visor. Um, which is uh, sensitive not just to visible light, but to things like tachyons and all sorts of interesting particles. Um, but having the sensor having detected those things, he has two neural implants on either side of his, of his temples with direct connection to his brain. And with the aid of this device, he has better than 20-20 vision because he can see in the infrared and uh, tachyons, etc. But the basic idea is that his... Uh, He's blind, but he can see perfectly well by bypassing the eye and going directly into the brain. And uh, although uh, we're not quite at that level yet, that is our goal, to uh, make Geordie a reality. And as you know, many of the things in Star Trek have been made realities. And about four years ago, the Australian government decided that they wanted to build a bionic eye and, um, and started a big national program, which is uh, $42 million for Australia. That is a lot of money for one project. And we took to, with great enthusiasm, to try to build this uh, and really turn Geordie into a reality. Now, in order to do that, you need a big team. Um, and one of the things that you learn about trying to build a bionic eye is that only by having everyone working together, can you hope to actually make something that actually works? And so one part of the team is the, um, is the people who build um, the, um, sorry, uh, the people who build bionic ears. And I don't know if you are familiar with the cochlear implant, but this is a very, very sophisticated and successful device. It is um, pictured here uh, with, the, uh, with the little coil that goes into the cochlea. And to make a long story short, this device has been implanted in 200,000 people across the world now. 80% of those devices are made in Australia. And deaf children who have this device can actually grow up in the hearing community and hear perfectly well. Remarkably, many of those children now have a second implant. When they turn 18, they're having a second implant which enables them for the first time to appreciate music, the directionality of sound, and be able to detect sound Within a, um, within a group of people in a busy party or, or a noisy environment. It's truly a fantastic technology that attests to the importance of signal processing, which is what's really happened over the last 20 years, but also um, the plasticity of the brain that is able to learn how to interpret a very limited amount of information. There are only 24 electrodes on this device, so 24 channels of information, and yet people can understand speech, speak on the telephone, and um, unless you're an expert talking to someone with a cochlear implant, you could never know that they were actually, um, that they were actually uh, deaf from birth. And of course, you need a team of surgeons who are capable of, uh, sorry, of implanting the device. And you also need uh, electronic engineers to build the hardware. And you need, uh, very importantly, people that can build the electrodes, the interface directly with the retina. And that is an enormously big challenge, and that's part of what we do in the University of Melbourne. Um, so it's a very large team of people, again for Australia, about 100 scientists. And my part of the team is pictured on the right-hand side. And in the background of that picture is the diamond reactor where we make the electrodes. And I'll have more to say about why we use diamond for making the electrodes in a minute. But, um, but let me start off by talking about what we're actually tr what the problem that we're actually trying to solve. So there are two classes of blindness that affect a huge number of people worldwide. One of them is retinitis pigmentosa. 
And to explain how this, uh, uh, what actually is happening here, I have to go back a little bit to the function of the retina. Now the retina is designed in a very unusual way. Um, at the front of the retina are the uh, ganglion cells that can be thought of as the hardware pickup of the electrical signals down the bottom here. Those ganglion cells uh, join eventually into a bundle that goes into the optic nerve and goes into the back of the, uh, into the, through the back of the eye and into the brain. But the actual receptors, the things that turn light into electrical signals are located at the back of the brain. Now, if you were designing a CCD camera, this is the last way you would do it. You wouldn't have the light passing through the electronics to get to the photoreceptors, only to send the signal back to the electronics and off to your detection system, uh, off to your electronic um, recording system. But that's the way the retina is designed. Uh, I've uh, spoken to the designer, but he refuses to change. He says that it's... Uh, that the specification has been fixed and uh, we just have to live with it. So indeed we do have to live with the design limitations. And it's really important to understand that we're not on a blank canvas here, that we have to design the electronics to fit the biology. We can't alter the biology to fit the electronics. So uh, in these two diseases, retinitis pigmentosa and age-related mac uh, mac uh, age macular degeneration, um, in both cases the, um, the photoreceptors have died. And so light no longer gets transduced into electrical signals. But the electronics is intact. So the, um, uh, the uh, electronic pathway is still there, but the transduction system is gone. And it's like a little bit like a, a CCD that's been, um, that you've irradiated with a laser. Um, the actual uh, small pixel that turns the light into an electrical signal is uh, burnt out, but the electronics is still in place. So our job is to, um, to actually stimulate the ganglion cells directly with electrical signals rather than uh, ra and replace the function of the rods and cones in the back of the eye that turn light into electrical signals. Uh, the two conditions, age-related macular degeneration, um, uh, is the macula is the central part of the, uh, of the eye. It's the part that helps you read recognize faces, expressions, etc. It's where the highest concentration of receptors are. And very sadly, in, um, in older people, that part of the retina degrades. And what they get is what you see on the left-hand side of the image. Uh, the central part of vision uh, goes, and gradually that grows bigger and bigger, that blurry part, until the person can't see at all. In uh, retinitis pigmentosa, the opposite is the case, the peripheral vision disappears and gradually the person gets tunnel vision which gets smaller and smaller until all sight is lost. So light comes in, we're going to replace the light by direct electrical stimulation. So having uh, directly stimulated, you might ask the question, where would you put the uh, output from Geordie's um, uh, visor, where would you connect it to? And there are a number of places that you could connect it to. Well, in one case, you could connect it directly into the visual cortex. The back part of our brain is the two sides, are a huge amount is devoted to vision. And you see in your brain, you don't see with your eyes actually, you see with your brain. The brain is, the, uh, is obviously in the visual cortex where all these signals are transformed into something that is actually meaningful. And so you might ask, well, why not put it directly in direct direct electrical stimulation into the visual cortex. Well, the, the manufacturer has failed to supply us with the appropriate manuals. And we don't actually know how to stimulate the visual cortex effectively. Um, you should not interpret this, um, these, these lines as being one-to-one -one connections. It's not like a CCD in which one pixel turns into one... Uh, one uh, um, one pixel on the CCD turns onto one pixel on your screen. It's far more complicated than that, uh, mainly because the whole of our visual processing system has been designed to detect patterns. We are very, very good at detecting patterns. Um, most of us can actually detect a face within billions of faces, and it's only now that facial recognition is starting to be uh, effective, and even then it can be fooled uh, in ways that human beings can't be fooled. And that's because the pre-processing that takes place here is enormous. 
So, you, so even though we could put devices in the visual cortex, and some people are trying that, we don't know how to give effective vision to people by stimulating that. Do you think that will get better over time? Um, I'll tell you, I don't think it will get better unless we have a system which can both stimulate and record at the same time. So if you're thinking about this in physics terms, uh, in physics terms you like to map out the response function. To map out the response function of the brain you need to stimulate and record rather than simply passive recording. So people have tried to do that to some extent, but the problem is the visual cortex is very big, very big as in terms of brain. So in order to do that, and I believe there's a talk this afternoon that's talking about mapping the brain, you need to be able to record a huge amount of information at high spatial resolution and at high temporal resolution in response to a very well-defined input signal. As soon as we can do that, we may be able to... Um, the, other, the other problem is the images that you're actually do, are showing are, um, are images that are constantly moving and constantly changing. And how is the brain going to learn to use those signals? So, yes, I think so, but not in the first instance. So we have chosen to put the, uh, our, our implants at the retina. And the reason for this is that everything we know about successful, operationally successful implants would indicate that the closer you are to the origin of the natural origin of the light, the more of the natural circuitry that you can keep intact, the better your chances are of getting an operational effect. So the cochlea, for example, is a minimally invasive um, and minimally invasive uh, implant. It's a wire that that basically goes into the cochlea, replaces the hairs that do the transduction, but all of the other circuitry is left untouched. So even having chosen to put the, sa put the device into the, into the eye next to the retina, you have a number of choices about where to put it. And um, one of the places that you could put it is in, the, in a pocket called the suprachoroidal pocket at the back of the eye which is a, um, a sort of uh, between the back, back of the eye and the retina, there's a, 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 a flap of skin where you can put a device. It's an excellent place to put it because the flap closes and keeps the implant in place. It's not in the gooey stuff in the middle of the eye where there's uh, saline, etc. However, there is some physics here once again. If you want high resolution, you've got to be very close to the receptors. You know, if you're... If you're, uh, doesn't the f you can't cheat here, right? If you're, in a, if you're looking at a car that's very far away from you, it's got two headlights, doesn't matter how good your optics are, if you're too far away, the two headlights look like one headlight. And that's exactly the point. So although the suprachoroidal space is great from a positioning point of view, the best place is to put it here epiretinally. And you can imagine the difficulty of that. We have to actually get inside the eye and put our device right next to the retina this is no mean feat. Um, but I'll tell you how we have tried to do that. Nevertheless, the first thing we wanted to find out was whether or not we could design a device that would actually give people a sensation of light. And the first device that we have actually uh, designed does go into the suprachoroidal space and it basically has an array of electrodes that look something like this uh, this has 98 electrodes. The device I'll actually show you only has 24. But one of the things you can see here is that, again, to go above about 1,000 electrodes here, just uh, 100 electrodes, just becomes impossible because if you're limited to two dimensions, you just can't fit more electrodes in. Even if you make them smaller, dealing with all the wires becomes an impossible task and it's a, ta and it's a, it's a problem that we've solved. But anyway, uh, in the first instance, our first device, very, very first device, is, works like this, and I hope the movie works. It's basically a, um, a, a, an array that does go in the suprachoroidal space, and it's only got a smaller number of electrodes. It's designed for patients with uh, uh, retinitis pigmentosa. Um, there, are, there are a number of uh, pixels here, and the uh, signals come from the outside, via a cable into the back of the eye. And I want to show you the results of the first, um, oops, the first patient that's been fitted. Her name is Di, Di, Di Ashworth, and this is a little video clip about 
her experience. A vision impaired Melbourne woman's been able to see again thanks to a world first. While she can only see shadows and colours, it's changing her life and putting Melbourne scientists at the forefront of bionic eye research. Amy Parks has the story. The eye disease retinitis pigmentosa began destroying Dye Ashworth's sight nearly 30 years ago. But this was the moment scientists began to turn back the clock. <laughs> you know, I just went, wow, you know, because I just didn't expect it at all. It just, yeah, but it was amazing. We were all very nervous. Um, perhaps the calmest of all was dye. Electrical impulses are sent to a prototype implant behind dye's retina, which are then recognised by her brain as vision. Dye will be able to see a number of spots in different locations and will be able to see things like shapes and the edges of doorways and objects like that. Seemingly small, but it could be enough to light the way for researchers developing a bionic eye and to give hope to thousands of vision impaired patients. It is possible that later on we may be able to use the devices for patients with age-related macular degeneration. As exciting as this development is, it's just the first step. The holy grail for researchers will be a bionic eye with ten times the power of this first prototype, which will allow patients to recognise faces and to read large print. But even in these early stages, it's the realisation of a dream. I've always believed, always believed that there would be something. Amy Parks, <laughs> Seven News. In the beginning, doesn't know anything, also, it adapts to the sensors it sees. So, there are other experiments over the tongue and so on. So, when you put this in, the vision should, I mean, the, how the person interprets the vision should improve over time. Right? Yes. Because the brain is getting adapted to the signal of what it sees. Exactly. Exactly. So, dye comes in every, every week and has a session in which, in the first instance, the voltage on each one of the pixels is individually. I'm sorry. Um, in the first instance, each one of the pixels is, um, uh, the voltage is increased until she says, yes, I see a flash of light. And gradually, we then join two pixels together to try and make a letter or a line or a shape. And we ask her, do you see a line? Do you see a vertical line or a horizontal line? And the learning exercise is all important, which is why we wanted to start with even a simple device to see how well the brain would actually interpret the signals. And that's a really central point. Cochlear implants, for example, people have been given them 18 years ago, or even 30 years ago, still using the same hardware, the same implant hardware, but the software has improved as we know more and more how to stimulate. It's a very complicated problem in two dimensions because there's timing, there's proximity. Um, should we be giving the letter L, for example, in all the pixels excited at the same time, or should they be excited in some form of, uh, with some form of temporal uh, separation? And we just don't know the answers to that question. But Dai is learning rapidly. Now, um, uh, I, so in order to determine what we would need in order to be able to um, get people to read large print and see faces, we have to determine what the minimum number of pixels would be. So what do you see there? There's 16 pixels, 64 pixels, and here are 1,000 uh, pixels or 1,000 of what we call phosphenes, which are dots of light, artificially generated dots of light. Now, who can see what that is? Yes, what is it? Sorry? Sorry. A Melbourne tram. A Melbourne tram, very good. Are you from Australia? <laughs> I came just to hear a beautiful Australian accent. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's, that's something really interesting. A lot of people can't see that when the uh, resolution of the, <laughs> of the projector is very high and they're close, but you're all pretty far away from the screen and so you can see it and I can see it very clearly. So there you go. A thousand pixels is enough to be able to recognise a shape of something. And, and uh, okay, of course it's not at the same, you know, uh, megapixel, but enough. And um, what do you see here? Nothing, 64 nothing, but a, a, by the time you get to 1,000 phosphenes, you can easily see large print. And so for a person running around um, outside who wants to be able to, for example, read a street sign, uh, which is something that um, blind people can't do at the moment, um, then um, 1,000 phosphenes would be enough. So how are we going to produce 1,000 phosphenes? I showed you before 
um, the devices, you can well imagine that trying to scale that technology up to a thousand dots is not going to work because you just can't. I mean, there's just a, a physical limitation, geometrical. So this is our device. It's called a high acuity device and it basically consists of a thousand pixels directly put into the eye. And um, there's a picture, I'll show you many more pictures of this, but that's basically the design of the device. It fits at the back of the eye. This is the business end of it. This is a piece of plastic, if you like, that holds it in place with retinal tacks. And there's a lead that comes out um, either to a coil uh, in the back of the head for wireless transmission um, and uh, power. So, uh, but before we get too far ahead, we need to define a material that is able to actually stimulate the, the retina. And this is surprisingly difficult because it's got to do a lot of things. It's got to be mechanically durable, electrically conductive, core and an insulating body in order to have a differentiation between an on and an off. It's got to be biocompatible, chemically inert. It's got to last a lifetime, right? You're going to put this thing in. It's got to last 40 or 50 years. It can't degrade. It's got to have high thermal conductivity because you're going to be putting in a power signal and you want the heat generated to rapidly dissipate. And it has to have a high charge injection capacity, which is a technical term in neuroscience referring to the minimum amount of charge that you need to inject in order to cause a neuron to fire. And that combination of properties in a package that's about three by three millimeters with a thousand pixels um, and can uh, cope with the electronics is no mean, is no mean uh, challenge. So uh, that's the challenge and here's a material that uh, you probably know of but perhaps don't know of its uh, properties um, in the biological sphere. So diamond has the following exceptional properties. It's the most thermally conducting of all materials which is not commonly known, often used as a heat sink for high powered electronics. It obviously is biocompatible. It's been used on heart valves and orthopedic implants for a long time. It's chemically inert. We clean our diamonds by putting them in a mixture of sulfuric, perchloric and, and nitric acid at 350 degrees boiling and the diamond says, oh, this is a lovely warm bath. Nothing happens to the diamond. So it lasts a lifetime. It's certainly chemically inert. It also has amazing electrical properties that I'll show you in a moment. And it's obviously very hard and robust. So, you might think that diamonds are very expensive, and yes, I'll continue to let you believe that, but in fact, we make diamonds in our lab every day in a reactor that is no more complicated in principle than your microwave oven at home. And basically, the recipe is put in a uh, container containing a methane and hydrogen, uh, put into the microwave oven, press high, leave for six hours, and uh, remove and admire your diamonds. And here on the left, top left-hand side, you can see the, a picture of uh, the microwave. You'll, you'll recognize that foil as the same foil that you have inside your microwave oven at home. That's to stop the microwaves getting out. And you may be able to see just inside there's a, um, there's a, a uh, hemispherical dome. And inside there, there's a very bright blue glow. And that's a glow of a plasma that is breaking up the methane into its constituent carbon and hydrogen components. And under the right conditions, um, that carbon deposits onto a substrate as diamond. And on the right-hand side, you can see some lovely little diamonds that have been created. Um, and that, that reactor that I show you there is a, a toy reactor. This is a more industrial strength one that we have in the laboratory that actually produces um, diamond. And we set it cooking for not just six hours, but maybe 24, 48 even 72 hours, and the diamonds slowly grow. That might be considered to be a long time, but considering that most of the diamonds have formed over billions of years, we figure that a week to make a beautiful diamond isn't too long. Um, but actually, the remarkable thing about diamond is that there is a huge amount of variability. You can go all the way from single crystal diamond to polycrystalline diamond and nanocrystalline diamond and ultra nanocrystalline. There's a whole range of properties and um, one of the most remarkable thing about the properties of the diamond that's not commonly known is you can adjust it from highly insulating from 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12 ohm centimeters, all the way down to only uh, 0.01 ohm centimeters. And all you do, all you're doing is changing the nitrogen concentration in the reactor. 
Uh, by adding nitrogen, you can create material that's highly conducting. And that's a remarkable thing. Um, and we don't know of any other material that has that property of being able to change the same material from being so insulating to so conducting. Silicon, of course, can be doped, and that's the basis of so much of our technology, but not, not over that range at room temperature. So this is the difference in the microstructure. Now, for the neuroscientists who apparently have made the uh, transition from neuroscience into Google, it may be interesting to note this sort of uh, fine structure here. And it turns out that neurons love this structure. It just has the right, um, the right morphology, and neurons love growing on this stuff. Um, and I, uh, I'll, I'll just um, say something about that point and come back. This is a complicated slide visually, but really the, the point to be made here is that the second column is a column showing neurons growing on nanocrystalline diamond without any of the normal growth mixtures that are at the promoters that are usually made to promote the adhesion of neurons to surfaces. These two, the, the third and fourth columns, have in them uh, traditional growth methods with those extra growth factors, but the, first, the second column is uh, nanodiamond without any of the growth factors, a remarkable thing that the, diamond, that the neurons will grow on it without any additions. So going back to then how we actually make our devices, I'm sorry I'm flicking around a bit. So we start off, uh, oh, we start off with a piece of solid diamond in which, there are, which we cut holes with a laser. You can't drill the diamond with anything. Those holes are about 50 microns in size. And then we coat the entire diamond with the, poly, uh, with the conducting material and then we isolate with a laser and uh, this is a side view. So we get something that looks like a bar of chocolate. Each one of those uh, squares is conducting material and the important thing is that the conduction goes all the way to the back which means that we can have a dense electrode, of array, a dense electrode array which has um, contacts at the back electrodes at the front and this gives us the technology we need in order to get both high density and um, in a package that is implantable into the eye. And I'll show you the complete package as we go through. But uh, and now the importance of this from a design perspective is that all the body sees is carbon, diamond. It's just diamond. And in fact in this picture here you can see the diamond had the ultra nanocrystalline diamond growing into the hole that we've drilled. And there's no gap here, right? And now, if you, if you know anything about electrodes for uh, neurochemistry, there's always interfaces, right? You've got, interf and those interfaces are always the points of failure. In this case, there's no point of failure because it's all one material. It's true, some of it's conducting and some of it's insulating, but it's all one material diamond. And indeed, when we've tested whether or not there are any holes in here, or cracks, etc., this is the these uh, th we do this test just by having a squirt of helium, seeing if the helium can get through to our detector. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, there's a hole, and you see the helium immediately leaking through. But in our devices, there's no hole, and the blue curve just shows you what happens when we try to see. And there are about a thousand holes and a thousand drills, so we're very confident that we have a hermetic seal. Now the importance of this is, this is ultra important. It doesn't matter if you have an Android phone or a iPhone, if you drop it into the toilet, it's game over, right? It doesn't take long, you drop it in the toilet, three minutes later, it's, it's history. Unless you're very lucky and, you know, maybe you can get it to recover. But basically, get it wet and it's game over. And, that can't, and we're going to put this electronics into the eye and want it to be there for 40 years and the eye is 37 degrees in a concentrated saline solution so you've got to make sure that it's hermetically sealed otherwise your chip which you've spent a lot of money uh, making and developing is just going to give up the go straight away and short out. So hermeticity is very important. Um, what about biocompatibility? Well in this experiment we took a slice of diamond and compared it to other materials which we slid into tissue and then took out some time later to see what the reaction is. Now in this picture blue is bad and red is good. Blue is tissue that has been damaged and, is, uh, and has died. 
reddish tissue that's still alive. So silicone is the standard material that's used all the time in all bionic devices. It's a plastic, a plastic, a silicone plastic. And uh, you can see that a slice of silicone creates some damage around where it was implanted. But there's no adverse, no big adverse reaction. But here's the diamond and you can see that the diamond actually has a smaller reaction than even the polycrystalline silicone. And uh, this is stannous octoate which is known to generate an inflammatory response. So that's our negative control. Um, so the, do the diamond is doing really well. There's no, uh, compared to any other material, the reaction of the body to the diamond, the body says, oh, I quite like you and there's no problem. You can stay here as long as you like. Well, we don't actually have a vasculature in the retina, right? That's the, in the ganglion cells, the, the, uh, the blood supply is at the back, right? Not at the, not at, there's no, very little blood supply actually going through into the ganglion cells. Um, and this is just a histology, uh, a, a histology. The blue curve in the, the blue lines in here are the response or a response to um, a bad response, if you like, and basically the response of the diamond is almost non-existent compared to the controls. Sorry. Can I ask another question? Sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a fair amount of vasculature on the front cover. So, I mean, that's what you're basically imaging with the alfalfa. So, can you repeat the question? Ah, uh, yes. The question is, uh, what happens to the effect of the uh, diamond on the blood supply, effectively? On, and um, well, don't forget, of course, that well, um, uh, your question is basically, what happens to the the retina underneath the device in terms of uh, longevity? And I'll show you some pictures that uh, that that indicate that there's no adverse reaction. Yeah. Uh, I'll show you the I'll show you the picture of, of that. It, it does not appear that we have a, a big problem in that regard. Um, what what actually I will say is that what we don't know is what happens after we stimulate for a long period of time and whether that causes any neuronal damage. That we don't know. We do know that the device is perfectly safe for a short period of time. We don't know if it's safe for a long period of time because we haven't been going long enough in our project to have that data, but, um, but we certainly don't see any, any damage locally. Um, no, they're smaller than the cochlear implant because of where we are in the body. Um, okay, so getting to um, your discussion, what are the, the, now there's not just a design limitation in terms of space, there's also a design limitation in case of voltage. Now I'm sure most of you have once upon a time put a couple of electrodes into a bath of salty water and watched bubbling away of the, uh, at the electrodes uh, in which one electrode is producing hydrogen, the other one is producing oxygen and that's the basis of course of the hydrolysis of water. That's something you do not want to happen inside your eye, right? So there's something called the safe limit for, um, for, uh, uh, for neural excitation. You must stay away from uh, going above Vmax or Vmin because if you exceed Vmax or Vmin you're actually going to be generating little bubbles of oxygen and hydrogen and that's going to be a disaster inside the eye. So any neural stimulator has to stay away from that. And it turns out that once again Diamond, nature has been kind to us in this case and Diamond has this extraordinarily large window of, um, if you like, uh, stability in which you do not generate oxygen and hydrogen. So we've got to play from minus one and a half volts to one volt. Um, and that's a very wide window. Most materials do not have anywhere near that wide window uh, in order to stimulate. And um, this is getting more technical, but basically there are two voltages that are important. One of the voltages is um, the compliance, if you like. So what you do is that you put, a, you put a pulse onto your electrode, there's an immediate rise in voltage uh, and in that case you're just overcoming the series resistance. And then as time goes on, you're actually charging, effectively charging up a capacitor. 
and you want the capacitance to be as big as possible so that the voltage you need to apply in order to get a certain charge is as small as possible. So actually what you want is for this curve to be as flat as possible and it's this V2 that cannot exceed that one volt because if it exceeds the one volt then you, you will actually get, oops sorry, you will actually start to get that um, uh, effect of hydrolysis of water. So in the Id absolutely ideal electrode this would go up and then it would be completely flat. Of course it's never like that but um, you want this V2 to be as small as possible. So um, to our actual results. So the first result that we, that we did is, was this. We took some retina from an animal and we laid it down in a dish over our device, over our diamond device. And then we, you know, it, then we stimulated, uh, put a voltage onto our electrode and we had what's called a patch clamp, which is a method of uh, detecting a, neuro, a neuron firing. And so we apply a voltage to our electrode and we see whether or not neurons that are far away are actually firing and can we get a response. And it turns out that we get an outstandingly good response from this to, to this is basically when the voltage goes on and every time we put a voltage onto, the, um, onto our electrode we got a, um, a, a, the neuron firing and this is sort of a histogram of the effect. So obviously we need to put enough charge into the system to get the neuron to fire and so this is actually, the blue line is actually telling you that depending on how far the neuron was away from the, uh, from the, um, uh, from the stimulate, stimulation source, the probability that you will get actually the uh, appropriate number of, um, uh, of stimulations. So obviously what we want is for there to be a high probability that every time we put a voltage onto the, onto the uh, electrode that we will get a neuron firing. That's the point. Um, and, uh, and basically without going into a lot of the detail, these results indicate that we have, that within the compliance, the safe limit, we can easily apply every time enough voltage onto the electrode to get the neuron to fire without any danger of having that um, electrolysis of the water. Are, are you hopeful for super resolution by like, using two electrodes, you know, the neurons between different ones? I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get to that in a minute. This was to ask the question, can we get this material, which is not the traditional material for putting inside the eye, which is uh, platinum or, or, or perhaps iridium oxide, can, is it good enough? So. So then we did the next thing, right? The next thing is, in fact, can we get this to actually respond? And here is the acid test. So what we did, again, in a test animal is we put, now in this case, the electrode is actually in the eye and on the retina. So this is the real pointy, oh, this is the real pointy end of the system. So we put in the back of the, of the head of the animal a array of electrodes that uh, are designed to see whether or not the, the visual cortex is firing. So now you're talking about testing the entire circuit. And then what we did is we put a voltage onto our electrodes, and the electrodes here are different sizes and shapes and ganging together of electrodes, and we put a voltage on and see if we get signals. And indeed, at the back here, uh, this is when we stimulated, and these are the signals, these stars represents the voltages, the spikes inside the visual cortex. So this is really working, right? Because you're putting a voltage onto the electrode and the spikes are occurring at the back of the, uh, at the, back, of the, uh, at the back of the brain. Now we can't tell what the animal is actually seeing, but we do know that the circuitry is in place and that the, uh, that the system really works. So uh, this is a, a very important graph for us. This was the question, what is the, uh, how many spikes do we get in response to the current that we put onto the electrode? Because that current is really important. We need to keep that current as small as possible and yet have a high probability of stimulation. And so you see here that at 10.8 microamps, we've got four spikes per, per pulse. And it turns out that that's, that's fine in terms of both the compliance of our stimulator chip, which I'll show you in a moment, and the biology. So uh, this is a really uh, a nice result for us, and um, 
and, uh, and gives us also some window for um, contrast, if you like. Yeah, any questions? So is it clear what that graph is, is showing? So just to say, this is the number of spikes actually in the visual cortex in response to the current that is being put onto the electrode in the eye. So it's gone all the way through the neural system to the back, and if we put, say, 20 microamps, then we'll get eight spikes in the visual cortex. So, uh, in a way, you are measuring uh, the uh, response of visual cortex to uh, visual stimulation. To an electrical stimulation. So, like, uh, did you compare it with the actual, uh, how an eye would function and what would be the response of the cortex? Yeah, I mean, if you put a flash of light into the, into the eye, you ensure you'll get, um, you'll get signals in the visual cortex and so I don't know how many spikes you get per pixel of light but that's been that's well established. The closer you get to that uh, response the better vision is going to be right. That's right the lower the lower the current uh, that you can that you can put in uh, and still get the spikes at the back the better the the better the device is going to be. The lower the power the higher the resolution etc. And uh, this is just a histogram showing that uh, of the different electrodes and the ganging of the electrodes, just to, just to indicate that it wasn't just a one-off. Now, um, so, so the electrode array works, but of course in order to get our thousand pixels, we need to actually, um, we need to encapsulate the device in a way, uh, sorry, we need to have a stimulator chip, which has all the electronics on it, and we need to encapsulate this in a capsule that is going to be um, to keep the electronics safe for the lifetime of the patient. Um, so here we've got sort of, uh, uh, although this shows penetrating electrodes, here is the, um, here is the chip and here are, um, here are some uh, indium dots to give us the bonding. And I'll show you more pictures of that in a moment. But the important thing is that this entire thing needs to be encapsulated. Now the way that encapsulation has worked in the past is with a titanium can. Basically, you, this is if you have a pacemaker, you get the same thing. You, you put all the electronics into a titanium can and you seal the titanium can with, um, with, um, uh, with uh, a laser. But of course, that's not ideal for the thing that we have in the body, our tiny little device that has to go inside the body. Um, and titanium isn't the ideal material for, for this uh, if we want to stay true to our design principle of the body only seeing diamond. Uh, but before I tell you about the fact that we can use diamond, the, um, the thing is that you need a barrier that lasts a lifetime, that's biocompatible, you want it to be an insula, uh, you want it to allow wireless signals to come through, so titanium is not the best option. Um, you have to have the feed-throughs. It has to be sterilizable as well before it goes into the body, which, uh, and it's got to be uh, heat resistant. Uh, what this means is you can't just bake this thing at a thousand degrees because of course the chip will just die. So this is our solution, which is basically to have a diamond box. So not only is the electrode array made of diamond, but the box is also made of diamond. And then it is, uh, and then we put a, um, a special material between the two boxes, and then we seal them shut. And in fact, um, and in fact, this shutting um, is a very important part. And what you see on the left-hand side, well, firstly, what you see on the right-hand side is a diamond box with a, uh, a, a sort of an optical picture of the diamond box, and along this um, red part is where the braze goes. And in this picture down on the left-hand side, you see two diamonds, uh, let me see, this is diamond, this is the material that's being used as the glue, here's another diamond, this is the material that's being used as the glue, and this is what happens after you join the two of them together. Um, and basically the point of this picture is to show that the braze line is continuous and there's no leakage. So um, if I can show you how it all sort of fits together, here is the diamond box, it's got some feed-throughs mainly for power um, and um, that diamond box is drilled out of a single monolithic piece of diamond. Here is our array with our, in this case, uh, thousand electrodes, although the first device will have 256. 
Here are some isolating capacitors. Um, here is now the chip that I'll show you in a picture, the stimulating chip, which is ball bonded down onto the, um, onto the electrode array. And then the final thing is that the box comes on the da on, onto the uh, device and is then sealed um, with a laser. And here are the actual devices. So here is a device with, uh, with our chocolate. Each one of those squares is the electrode. Um, this is a more sophisticated device that has some shaping so that it fits a little bit better into the space. Here is the actual size of the device. Here you see the, um, the spots which are for power feed-throughs. This is an SD card, so this is, gives you the length scale. Those are the electrodes on SD card. And here is the entire device. Here it is um, in its silicone housing, ready to be implanted into, into the eye. And here is a flexible cable that comes out the back of the eye. Um, and the stimulator chip has actually been just delivered to us. I must say I'm very impressed by our electronics people because the entire real estate of this is the electrodes. Because we've only got three by three millimetres to play with. And that relates to the fact that we've got to make an incision in the eye and the surgeons want it to be a tiny incision, very flat, very small, so they can seal it up afterwards. So this is the actual stimulator chip. In this case, 256. All of the electronics, control electronics, is underneath each one of those electrodes, which I think are about 80 by 80 microns each. Um, and uh, each one of those electrodes is independently addressable and controllable and can produce voltages from minus 3 to plus 3 volts. I think it's um, a quite an accomplishment um, at this extremely low power. Um, and it's also very safe because there are no DC voltages. The only minus is that we've got to put onto this chip um, our... Um, uh, the, it needs some capacitors and we have to put that onto the chip, um, onto, the st uh, onto the electrode array, as I showed you before. Um, and the, here is some technical stuff about the, um, about the data, and, and I think it's a very impressive accomplishment to have a chip that's so small, physically small, and yet so flexible. And here is the entire device. Um, here is a picture of why we need some shaping, just to match the curvature of the retina. Um, and uh, here is a now going to be a picture of what it's looking like as we um, actually put it into a, um, uh, into a person. We're not quite at the point of putting it into a person. We're still uh, in the, in the uh, preclinical trials, in the animal trials. But nevertheless, um, the device is, um, is ready to be put, uh, is ready to be uh, extensively tested. So here you see the device which is uh, the little, the, the, the square in the middle is the diamond device. Uh, in fact, we only use one tack at the moment. Those are the retinal tacks that hold it in place. Here is the, uh, now the sort of blow up of the device. Here you see it um, uh, in more detail. And uh, if the video actually uh, catches up with my computer, uh, there you'll see the various components, which are the chip, the cap, and the, um, and the uh, driver electrode in the middle. Yes. You talked about the surgery, the challenge of having a small. So it sounds like there's a large area of retina with, this, with all the um, connections in the back there. If there was some sort of breakthrough in surgery and you could have a larger area to work with, you was, is there much more of the, op of the optical nerves back there that you could use? Yeah, the retina goes most of the way along the back of the eyeball. We, um, there are some limitations you want to avoid the optic nerve. Um, but the, uh, the answer to your question is that um, uh, we could happily, and for, for example, a neural implant at the back of the head, which we could use a very similar technology for where we don't have the limitation, we'd be very happy to make our devices centimetre by centimetre. But, the, but it's the surgery, because if you've got a device that is a centimetre by centimetre, you'd mean to make an incision in the eye that's too big, at the moment too big. I, I guess the part I don't understand is, are there um, connections to the brain that you're just not using because yes. they don't have the real estate? Yes. And one of the reasons for that also is that it's actually quite rare for people to be completely blind. 
So we want to be careful not to affect any residual vision and so the device is naturally relatively small but in the fullness of time we will um, either make bigger devices or put more than one uh, chip in. So the, so the photoreceptors that you're not touching are still work basically? It depends on the patient. In AMD the central part of the vision is gone but the peripheral part is often still working. In retinitis pigmentosa by the time patients are often in their 30s they've lost nearly all their useful vision. Uh, but it, it depends on the individual patient, which probably, which means of course the patient selection and a detailed appreciation of the exact state of that particular retina is going to be very important in the design of the devices eventually. Uh, so is, it, is there a chance, uh, so is it, are you definitely, are they, is it, oh thanks. So my background actually is I have slow RP, so I'm thinking ahead to 30 or 40 years when I, I might actually only have my central vision and be able to read and not want to lose this, or I may be like, um, like maybe you're probably a candidate patient who's lost all their vision from RP. So I'm wondering if there's a possibility in the future that this, that I might have an implant like this and preserve my natural central vision if those are the photoreceptors that are still really healthy. So in principle, there's no reason why we can't make an annular implant to retain the central part of the vision and do the peripheral part of the vision. Um, the surgery is not obvious. Uh, that's a, a major challenge. Um, and so we need to be able, but, but the question is then, can we place the retina in the right place? I think that where we're working to now is taking photos using OCT of individual retinas and then designing the holder to match that particular retina. So um, it, is, it is certainly conceivable that we won't be implanting all patients right on the macula but rather on the peripheral, peripheral vision. And that would require not really a breakthrough in the technology you're talking about here but probably advancement in surgery. I don't know about advancement, I think practice. Practice and, um, uh, and also some materials because the size of the wound that needs to be then fixed, uh, you can't have, the, um, can't have the eye leaking out fluid after the surgery. So, um, and there are, there are techniques, I mean surgeons go inside the eye with remarkable dexterity. So, uh, but clearly they haven't been asked to to do this. So getting the exact thickness of the silicone and its shape and its size right is, is, a, is an iterative matter. But yes, I, I don't see any reason in principle why it can't be put not in the macula, which of course will be an easier, easier ask. At the moment, from an ethic point of view, ethics point of view, we would only put these devices into completely blind patients. Strain on your device, and uh, how ah. are you dealing with that issue? Okay, so that's a, uh, uh, yeah, spoken like a true uh, biologist. That's a, that's a real, uh, a real issue. Um, where was that picture? So, um, oh, by the way, sorry, I'll just, just, um, I'll just show, uh, uh, give you a, uh, hopefully a half, a bit of a picture answer. This is a fundus image before the device was put in. And here it is actually inside. So you can see we've avoided the optical disc. Here is our silicone ring. Here's the tack. And here's the diamond electrode sitting actually inside the eye. Um, so it does work. Uh, now your question is, um, is this in the right place? Well, there's no reason in principle why, uh, you know, this can't be shaped a different way and that this can't be placed in a different place. So I think that would be highly dependent on taking um, uh, these images and not just in one dimension but in three dimensions creating and creating a particular mold for a particular eye. Um, now your question was with regard to the, um, the feed through I think um, and yes that well firstly uh, I'll go back to hopefully where here 
You're worried about this lead? So firstly, um, the lead that we've developed uses the same sort of technology as the lead in the cochlear implant. It's a very clever spiral that has both flexibility and, and strength. And we've actually tested some of these devices on a sort of artificial eye moving around millions of times and making sure that the electrodes don't break. But more particularly, um, the question is with regard to the relative motion between the outside and the inside. Now, in order to overcome that, we uh, actually try to make we, the the final device will have a um, will have the coils that are that there won't be any relative movement between the inside and the outside. There will be the um, um, everything will be internal inside. Now, that's not where we're at at the moment, but that's certainly a design consideration. More particularly, one of the issues for vision is where people are actually looking. So, you know, our, our visual processing, it's not just the signals that are coming from the eye, from the retina, it's also where the eye is looking. That goes into the, into the back of the brain. Our ability, for example, to determine whether we are moving or the object is moving or it's a combination of both is quite remarkable. So there are a lot of inputs going in and one of the things that we need to also be doing is tracking where the eye is looking in order to get the maximum. And that will go into the vision processor. That information will go into the vision processor to alter the picture that is actually the, the stimulating. You know, our eye, I mean, it, when I started doing this, it's enormously complicated. For example, I didn't know that our eyes are constantly dithering because if you continue to stimulate the same neuron again and again and again, it stops responding. So our eye is dithering constantly so that the image isn't on the same neurons and then the back of the brain gets rid of it. It's sort of an anti-shake uh, software that's uh, embedded into the eye. And we won't even begin to talk about how the brain integrates information from vision and hearing. That's even more, that's even a, a more interesting story. Did you have a question? No. So, um, yeah, so we're very well aware of the mechanics. Um, I will say as a final comment is that although we've made enormous progress with regard to the hardware and, and getting all the bits and pieces, the real, real challenge will be the software and the processing to be able to give signals that patients will be able to interpret um, in terms of vision. Now, in the case of the cochlear implant, there have been a couple of breakthroughs. One of them was, for example, that sounds are delivered sequentially in time, that the electrodes are not all stimulated at the same time. They're stimulated um, with, uh, in, uh, as a, ser a series of peaks. Now, that's not how we, uh, people normally hear. You normally get all the frequencies all at the same time. But this seems to work very well for cochlear implants. Now, the trouble with the vision is that we've got too many, we've got so many parameters. We've got time, but now we've also got space. And how are we going to try to optimise these electrodes? So in the beginning, obviously, you're going to test every electrode and see what voltage you need in order to get a spot. But then how are you going to start to get um, optimization of shapes? And then how will you get optimization of movement? So there's going to be a really, uh, from a computer science perspective, this is going to be a really enormously interesting challenge. And my personal belief is we need some sort of dynamic genetic algorithm because I don't think that we are going to be able to do this with an a priori algorithm. Uh, I would like to see some method that patients can actually be carrying around a processor that's learning all the time rather than having to come back into the laboratory to, uh, to be uh, optimised each time. But that's a work in progress. And to come back to one of the very first questions about you know, the mapping, it seems to me that with this device, one of the exciting research opportunities is because we now have, we'll have a thousand electrodes and we can test this and we can also be recording what's happened in the, in the visual cortex, we can actually start to map out that response function. I think that from a research perspective, that's probably one of the most exciting new tools that this technology is going to be able to contribute to the neuroscience community. So with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll end and thank you very, very much, both if you're looking 
uh, in, in virtual time uh, or in virtual space and for those in the audience. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.